I'm very excited actually to be here tonight and to have this opportunity. So I'd like to thank Dr. Nadir for first uh, um, recommending that I do this. And um, I'd like to talk a little bit about myself, the company, and then as it was shared before, kind of go into the product and uh, quote unquote pitch it to you. Um, <clears throat> but in doing so, I'd love us to remember Obviously, there's a lot of application to our work, but we can today, just for the sake of the discussion, focus um, on, on the lives of the people that live with dementia, like Alzheimer's. And I love, as it was mentioned before, uh, taking this into concept around uh, polypharmacy and the use of medications such as uh, antipsychotics and antidepressants. So um, a little bit about me. So my name is Charles Zivirmo, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of this company called Linked Senior. And what we provide is what's called a resident engagement uh, platform. So in other words, we help organizations in long-term care, so like the nursing home environment, especially long-term care, engage their residents in a person-centered way. And um, you know, I started this company uh, 13 years ago. Uh, I pivoted, changed the product, and we've been growing pretty well in the past five years, really focusing on the outcomes of our work. Um, you know, notably of what I've done, I'm sure that some of us might be familiar with the work of the, of the validation method, Naomi file. Um, so it is, a lot of our work is around, again, best practices when it comes to dementia care and also person-centered care. I also want to know that one of the first things I did in started this company was uh, to certify myself as an activity director to really understand what is the frontline staff trying to do and then build uh, solutions to help achieve that. Um, so I thought, and then we, we discussed this a little bit before this meeting today, what we thought is to give a little bit of background on what it is that um, the market is trying to do, and then discuss the product. So you'll hear me talk a little bit about things that you might be familiar with that could be good reminders, or uh, just you know, what is going on in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the market in the US today. So, First and foremost, you know, just to give you a scope, we've been very fortunate in the growth of our company uh, since we changed our product, I think uh, almost six years ago, actually. One of the big, the big things that we did is that we integrated with, um, with Ponclic Care, which is the leading electronic health record. And then we partnered with a number of organizations across the aging continuum. Um, today, we're, we're, again, fortunate. We touch a little bit more than 40,000 lives in, the, in 43 states in Canada. And uh, we just got published last September for some research, and I'll explain that probably at the end of the presentation. But this work, just FYI, was funded by Baycrest uh, up in Toronto in Canada. So, you know, why are we here in the first place? Um, I'm sure that we all know the concept of social determinants of health, right? This idea that through an episode of care, more than 70%, 70% of um, what is linked to an outcome isn't actually just medical or clinical. It has to do with social aspects. And so I always like to, um, to start talking about our work in this context, because if we were to look at the budget of a nursing home, and if we were to think that social services and activities are the prime drivers and champions of uh, person-centered care, we would probably not find that 70% of our budget goes to in that direction, right? And actually, uh, the numbers are pretty staggering. We still see places where the budget of an activity director is less than $10 uh, per month per resident. So it's not much. Um, and obviously, there's different reasons. But I think that it's also an exciting opportunity because we can do, as a team, much more. And I think that one of the things that excites me to be on this pitch with physicians today uh, for this meeting is the fact that a lot of our work is working in teams towards that. So, you know, given uh, AMDA and, the, uh, and some of our work and, and what was taught, said before about the new rules of participation, I'm sure that we all know um, what are the basic concepts of person-centered care. But obviously, in the context of people living with dementia, obviously our work is to help these individuals be who they must be, right? And in the context of people that cannot self-recreate, our work is to provide meaningful engagement and experiences 
that matches their interests and source of purpose. And that work is very difficult, and we actually at LinkedIn you put a framework together to help us understand how to think about it. You know, as an organization, if we serve, say, 100 lives, we should be able to say in real time if we've engaged 100 people. And after that, we have to think about, are we actually be, uh, engaging people based on who they are, their needs and preferences? And obviously, because we're a healthcare industry, we have to think about well-being and outcomes. And interestingly enough, you, uh, you might be shocked in hearing that we still encounter a lot of organizations where they can't even tell you if it, they've engaged all of our residents, either because they're still using paper or they might be using different um, tools in the EHR, but none of the tools help them report in real time on that. Um, you know, activities, resident engagement is very challenging. Uh, there's a lot of turnover, obviously, in the industry. We don't staff much in this particular department. There's one in 60 residents. And obviously, um, most often the family doesn't visit. And because the, the residents, the older adults, cannot self-recreate, it comes back to us, the staff, and I say us, like people working in resident engagement, to engage them. And the end result is that the statistic that is kind of sad, which is, <clears throat> you know, how many minutes do we provide a resident a day? And so this, the CDC report came up with national average four years ago. It hasn't evolved too much. And that is 11 minutes of engagement of activities um, per resident in the skilled environment and then 20 in assisted living, right? So in the context, again, of people that can't self-recreate, what does that mean for their quality of life? What does that mean from them trying to seek and find ways to connect with their purpose, and all of the implications of that, them not doing that. And um, you know, just one other thought also is in, in these minutes in activities, we sadly sometimes joke about the old standards of activities, which is the three Bs, bingo and Bible and birthdays. And not that any of these are bad, but we know that our residents want and should be provided more with more. So this is kind of a quick overview of the background and how things are in the market today. I'm going to get now to our vision at Link Senior, and I'd love to hear some of your thoughts at the end. If you have any questions, feel free to interrupt. One, when we started to become successful was when we understood what a staff person is trying to do, right? And that staff person, any activity directors or any member in charge of life enrichment or resident engagement, wants to get to know the resident, plan something for them, engage them, and evaluate our work, right? And the main challenge in long-term care is we just don't have the tools to do this. Again, most of our life story or psychosocial assessments are done using paper, or they are a what's called a UDA in an EHR. And so in the end, we just have no way of saying, yes, we're providing meaningful engagement that not only meets the needs of our residents, but also help them drive purpose. And so I'm sure that all of you with a clinical slash, slash medical background re uh, realize this is a clinical process. In rec therapy, this is API, but in reality, it's something that people want to do but just can't. And so at Link Senior, we're very focused on this as our vision. We're passionate about this concept of how can we, quote unquote, prescribe resident engagement. And so here is probably going to be the bulk of my questions at the end and where I'm hoping to get some of your feedback, is we know that often, if not all the time, music and the concept of music therapy is probably better than non-pharmacologic, uh, I'm sorry, things like antipsychotic medication or antidepressant, right? And so for us, we're very passionate about how can we create tools and systems so that a community, a team, <clears throat> can make sure that resident engagement, person-centered engagement, is the first modernity before anything else. And so to achieve that, we, uh, we build different sets of tools. So this is our product. It supports the workflow of the staff. And again, <clears throat> it's this idea of moving people from paper to digital with all of the, the values and the benefits of doing that. And 
you know, just on the word prescribing, what we're very passionate also is when you think about prescribing from a technology standpoint, it is about recommending, uh, providing pathways to understand based on past experience, what is the best experience for the resident. So the product essentially is a way for us to collect things about uh, psychosocial data on the residents. So who are they, what are their preferences, what were their hobbies, and what are their source of interest, and what can we do for them? We then take that data, and we help the staff collect it, and on one hand, understand what are the clusters of our residents, but also for each resident, what is the ideal modality. The third part of our product is a very simple uh, to use app that can be placed onto different sets of hardware where the residents and the staff and the family members can find things that relate to reminiscing, uh, sensory programs, cognitive games, music, again, in the concept of music therapy. And the idea, again, is to empower the frontline staff so that they have the tools to engage any residents, no matter what their preference is, but also what they want or what they need, um, and so on and so on. So this can be used, as you can see from this picture, in group settings, right, to support the staff, but also in room visits, and very, very often in um, the case of helping people through behavior expressions, like wandering or being aggressive. Because we integrate with the EHR, we can track in real time how a building, how a community is doing in terms of engaging all of the residents. <clears throat> all of that data is also compiled for every single resident. And so at a high level, you know, one, are we engaging every resident? Two, how are the residents uh, reacting to the programs? And then three, we can see how our team spends their time. At the resident level, we have a good view of how the engagement is evolving, whether it's a decline or a change or an increase, and we can use that across the teams and with the family to understand what is being done to each individual. So in essence, one of the things that we're doing from an operational standpoint is that we're helping people measure activities, measure resident engagement, measure the impact of non-pharmacological intervention so that they can manage and optimize it. Um, so th this is pretty exciting in terms of work, and it's actually been validated by the study that I mentioned earlier. So this study was a year-long study in three locations that were long-term care and memory care in Canada. We had more than almost, almost 300 uh, participants. And the study was built in a way where, because we integrate with Poncler Care, the researchers had access to two sets of data. One is the resident engagement, so whether it was things used in our application or anything else that related to engagement. And the second set of data was the data coming from the EHR, the record, the health record of each individual. And so as you can see, these outcomes were pretty uh, significant. One, we saw you know, a huge increase in terms of social engagement, which is obviously a reduction of isolation. Despite the population being the frail, older adult, we did see an increase in cognitive functioning. And then, as you might have gathered, we obviously saw a decrease of antipsychotics, um, antidepressants as well, and then obviously a decrease of uh, aggressive behavior. From a financial standpoint, because we optimized the workflow, and because we uh, help in terms of research and preparation of programs, because a lot of our programs are ready to go, we obviously show a huge uh, decrease in terms of, um, well, I should, I should say an increase in terms of staff efficiency and savings of uh, about 22,000 per uh, building. Um, so I've been kind of talking super fast, but I, I'm sure you, most of you understand uh, the, the, this kind of study. The, what was really exciting for us is the fact that we were actually published in September. And so I'm happy as a follow-up to send uh, details about our, our research. So this is kind of the, the bulk, you know, kind of the presentation that I will need to give today. As you probably understand now, I started with the concept of person-centered care, why it's so important and what's missing. 
And then I apply that to our work, understanding how to build technology. And I showed you how the product works and then the outcomes that we got. So with that, I'd love to share kind of uh, two, um, two things that I know are happening. And then I'll get into my questions. As some of you might be aware, there are other industries um, and actually some other countries in Europe where a physician can prescribe things uh, based on the social determinants of health. So can prescribe something that is not uh, the typical medical thing. So for example, um, I know that, um, well, in Denmark, for example, a doctor can prescribe a membership to the gym if the person needs that, or a walk outside if the person is depressed and that kind of thing. And actually, last two months ago, there was a nursing home in Wisconsin where the physician prescribed a program called Music and Memory, which is obviously a music-based program, instead of an antipsychotic. So, as you can probably guess, a lot of my questions are about how, um, how do we as a company help a physician, uh, one, have the tools and the knowledge and the data but how can we make it that we as a team serving the older dog can think about prescribing or making sure that the first modality is something related to um, resident engagement, something that is non-pharmacological um, in essence. So with that, I, uh, I don't know how the format would lend itself, but I was hoping to get uh, from the audience, one, obviously we can start with feedback on the presentation, but one of the first questions we could get started is, what kind of evidence would you, as a, as a physician, would you need to make uh, engagement the first modality? Um, so we can pick an example here, which would be to prescribe antipsychotic medication to somebody living with dementia, such as Alzheimer's. So this is Swati. I can take a um, stab at this first. Um, so one of the things that um, I think I may answer this question, but um, I'll tell you that when we have our residents with dementia, we're always so worried about starting an antipsychotic. So I think, you know, for the most part, the first thing that we look at is, you know, were there any precipitating factors, but then, you know, there is a pattern to the behavior. And what I find, myself doing is oftentimes trying to you know play that game of let's guess what this person needs and try this non-pharmacological modality for example you know music therapy or let's try um the the essence you know the um um smell you know the uh, pray uh, lavender or something or give a um, baby, um, a doll to the person. So I'm blindly trying to, we are blindly trying to do things. Um, what this program actually is exciting um, me to do is that, you know, you are clearly getting an input and really trying to boil down as to what is more likely to work. And that to me is very exciting. So that, uh, you know, this kind of um, data gathering and actually keeping it in a format which is easily accessible um, is, is a huge benefit to me as a physician for patients um, with dementia and behavior issues. This, Great, this is, thank you. So, yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead, please. No, no, please. I interrupted you. Guys. No, this is this this is this is our. If <clears throat> I I mean I truly believe that uh, we need to review and find out ways on how we can prescribe things which are not medication. I mean, to me, uh, Charles, when you mentioned this approach, it was like a kind of a a, a bulb going off on in my mind. It's like why prescribing always need to be a pill or a chemical, and. Uh, there's always concerns around prescribing. Do you always kind of, whenever you're writing a medication you, you have in your mind is this pro and con debate going on is like, this chemical, is it going to be more beneficial than more harmful, right? 
And unfortunately, in geriatrics, there's a lot of grayness around it. So physicians prescribing medication in the geriatric field, and particularly around behaviors, are always struggling immensely. Uh, you know, of course, you can shut it out and become pretty normal about it. But it is still pretty hard for you to, on a day-to-day, make those decisions when you have a nurse calling about the behavior. It, is, it drains on you uh, because whatever chemicals we may have, we, we have for the, the dementia, for other problems, always have side effects in geriatrics. So I think the most important thing for me to know is that if, they, if the benefit to harm ratio is high, then I would love to have those things available in my armamentarium. And uh, I just never thought of the concept that a non-chemical thing like an activity, uh, which has a probably very high benefit to uh, uh, harm ratio, could just be a great strategy uh, of uh, getting physicians into this. So, uh, I mean, this, I am absolutely, you know, willing to pursue and really looking forward to what others say that about this as a physician or a practitioner really prescribing activity. It's, it's a very exciting uh, proposition. So. This is Dillard Elmore, um, and I have a question. Um, it, it, I like that it's very bespoke for the resident um, in question, but do does the program look at the facility? Because not all facilities are gonna have all of the um, different levels of care or activities that um, some of the more, you know, uh, state-of-the-art, non-rural, um, uh, facilities may have so when you make this prescription or these uh, recommendations is it giving the best that the facility can offer at that moment along with what the resident needs or is it just a blank prescription based on what the resident needs even if the facility can't live up to those uh, requests at that time yeah that's a great question <clears throat> so there's two ways to answer to that question. One is, in our application, um, the, the, the programs that we provide are available to anyone that has the internet connection. So no matter where you are and what type of building or what type of home you have, or if it's rural or urban, you would have access to high quality uh, programs. Now, in the case where what you're trying to do is not supported with a digital format, i.e. our application. So for example, say that you, you know, one of the recommendations would be to do uh, lavender, like, uh, like we, we uh, took that as an example before. We, we right now don't have a way to make sure that the, uh, that the building has that. Um, but that's a good point and I had not thought about it. So thank you for that question. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, I'm actually driving, so I apologize. I put myself on the you. I um, think. Yeah. And and uh, I, again, this is, this is yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, hi, Arif. Hi, Charles. This is Liz Jensen. Um, hi, Liz. Thank you for your presentation. It was great, and I. You know, as a so I'm a nurse, and I have um, worked with many skilled nursing organizations over the last 30 years or so. Um, from a program development perspective, and in, in particular, and the last gentleman who was just speaking, I think um, I, I I think I hear what he was saying, and I I would offer that I would agree that. When I'm re reading your question, what kind of evidence would you need to make engagement non pharmacological intervention the first modality before prescribing? When I think about how uh, a nursing practice, you know, currently happens in a lot of skilled nursing communities, um, you know, they're really driven by the um, by what the physician orders. Um, if the physician orders um, it orders the whatever it is. Um, the likelihood that it will be transcribed and implemented is, I believe, is higher. And I don't have, you know, evidence to, to tell you, you know, whether that's true or not. But I, I mean, that's that is how that is the, you know, the practice standard and how nurses would respond to, you know, an order like that. Now, you know, this is a non-pharmacologic intervention. It should be something that a nurse could, or an activity director, um, could. 
um, initiate independently. Uh, and I think we, we see that, you know, most certainly in many organizations, but there is, there is a weight that comes with that order. And there is a, I guess, a priority that um, gets created as a result of that. So I think the, the answer that I would have is what kind of evidence would you need to make? need to make is that what I would be looking to physicians for as a nurse would be, um, okay, we'll give this a try, but for how long? What length, you know, what is maybe a recommended length of time? How frequently should we do this? Um, you know, there's a level of kind of practical aspect of the implementation of it as a strategy. How long should we give this a try for before we have to call the doctor back? and to ask, you know, for something more or, you know, or to share, you know, what the outcome is. So I think that the practical application and the maybe protocolization of something like this would be really helpful. I see. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I add, my, my, my organization is in the process of de developing a um, comprehensive um, behavioral um, and dementia with agitation uh, uh, program. And these programs by nature have to be multidisciplinary. Uh, it, it cannot be physician driven. It cannot be therapy driven. It cannot be nursing driven. It has to be everyone at the table um, assessing the resident and trying the other modalities. Uh, even when you may need some pharmacotherapy you still don't stop with the um, the interventions because the interventions may lower the amount of uh, pharmacological intervention you need um, and, and still be beneficial. Right. Yes, I, I don't know if you can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, this is Carrie Levy and I was thinking how helpful it would be to have for your psychotropic drug review um, meeting a, um, a timeline that shows, okay, we've had trouble, here's the number of incidents we've had in the last month with this individual, we implemented X intervention on, you know, day 20 of this month, and then we have behavior tracking. And that way, um, as Liz mentioned, we've got um, some time period that we've said, let's try this for two weeks, yeah. and then let's follow yeah. up with a clinician after that. Um, and then we've got some very objective data for that particular resident. And we do this kind of thing with our um, our drug, do you know, our dose reduction. We'll say, yeah. come on guys, let's do this. <laughs> let's commit to it for two weeks and then we'll check in. And I think the same could be said of these interventions and doing one thing at a time. So we kind of know, you know, what that particular intervention uh, did and, and then I think we can be very methodical about it and then over time learn how to prescribe, as Swati was describing, you know, the specific intervention for that particular person and, and their behaviors um, that we're noticing. Yeah, and, uh, and, you know, and, and, and for us, and also the are you know, physicians kind of need a guidance on the formulary, like what is on the formulary? And that kind of starts defining their prescribing practices or, you know, in that facility or in that healthcare environment, right? I mean, this is easily available versus that, which is not very easily available. So I think developing an evidence of what your formulary is, like, you know, it's uh, connecting to internet to play chess is one thing uh, available on the formulary. What else is available? A cooking class, you know, remotely is available on formulary. Like, you know, whatever your formulary right. is and establishing some evidence and categorizing that into few categories, yeah. very simple categories, and building evidence around those formularies uh, could be also very compelling. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. I have a question. Do, do okay. you already have PC back in or is there some other way more PC back in? Because there was a few things I would add if you're looking for, you know, more, more, more back in from, um, you know, financiers are, are, you know, people that give you funds. Uh, I'm sorry, you kind of broke up. What was your question? So I do think you have, yeah. do you have venture capital backing already? Or Not are yet. you developing your pitch for VC to back you? Uh, right now we're very focused on, um, 
um, well, let me put it around. We, we should be uh, going to seek uh, institutional backing um, sometime in 2020. All right. So I know me, if I were looking at you as an investor, right, what I would like to see is the um, thing spelled out more to me because, I, uh, you know, it was a little bit unclear, you know, what the program was. I didn't realize that this, this was all through the computer and you could do things of that nature. So maybe seeing it in action, I think maybe a demonstration and showing the ease of use and how accessible and how, you know, um, you know, simple uh, that it is to basically, uh, you know, uh, bring it to any campus anywhere that has an internet, uh, you know, capabilities. Okay. I think I think that's a great point, for, uh, uh, you know, and I think for Swati, just I think this is good feedback for us, the IPAC and the uh, pitch webinar team is to kind of think about how we can send an introductory video or, or a small slide deck or some link for people who are going to join us beforehand to kind of play, play with it and look at it in a bit more detail. Uh, I think it may not be a bad idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. While I'm uh, listening to everyone um, give their opinions, you know, one of the things that, you know, Liz pointed out uh, is, is very attractive to me. You know, I feel like um, this kind of activity has a clear prophylactic. I mean, this is, if you turn this into a medicine, right, you would have a prophylaxis you know, before the behavior starts, and then you would have a therapeutic option. And I wonder if it can be clearly divided because um, it's what it, the behaviors that the dementia patients that may not have behaviors may start having behaviors if there's a vacuum of activity or there is a wrong kind of activity. For example, when, you know, everyone has news channel playing at the end of that day, we get multiple phone calls saying, oh, now we need something. So this could also be um, not just, now you're having a behavior issue, this is what you need, but you know, can we use this as a preventative um, arm? And then like, um, other physician had said, um, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name, very clearly structured prescription for therapeutic options um, based on the preference data that has already been taken and a very clear, I think for, I think he's talking about uh, presenting it to the VC, being very clear that there is content also that you're offering. I could, I was right. able to see the app feature on that so yeah yeah well and that's a great point uh you know because it's very easy for me to manage heart failure if i know what patient's dry weight is because i've been monitoring weight when they were fine right and the moon when they have an exacerbation now i see they have gained 14 pounds i know how much weight i need to get off so it, uh, that makes absolute sense that this is not an approach for crisis i think people would be able to comfortable writing quote unquote the prescription for it if they could share from, if they could hear from the nursing team, like, oh, Mr. Smith does really well, you know, with these activities and he's having a behavior, we're just gonna get him back on those activities. And is that okay if we just do that and monitor them? So if there's already an evidence about what interventions and what of the activities work for them, I think it'll be easier for a physician or a practitioner to prescribe those things with more confidence. Hi, this is Marco Kunz. I have a quick, two quick questions. One, how much staff time is involved in collecting and entering the data? <clears throat> and the other thing is, is are the programs available 24-7 because a lot of folks with dementia don't sleep through the night or their circadian rhythms are off? So is this available 24-7 yeah. and what is the, the burden of work on the staff members? All right, thank you. Thank you for your question. So typically, like entering data from the, um, the psychosocial assessment is faster than people using paper, and obviously it's less error prone. Um, the application itself is available 24-7 and actually is used right now 24-7. And to your point, 
often during nights, uh, the night shift where we might be light on staffing or typically there is no activity staff, um, any frontline staff person can use, like a nurse or an ONA can use the program. And then in terms of staff burden, um, well, we've actually documented with a study that it actually reduces the burden of the staff, especially given the fact that the uh, main application used with the residents already has millions of different pieces of content, um, you know, that can be used to engage residents. So in, ultimately, we're saving time uh, from the get-go. Thank you. Is that on too? Yeah, sure. No problem. So what is the cost to the facility? Is this something that the facility has to pay for or are you billing CMS directly? Uh, we're not, we'd love to bill CMS, but we haven't had the opportunity to do it yet. Or, uh, um, yeah, yet, I guess. We, yes, yeah, so we contract with the provider. Uh, so either the long-term care or the memory care or the assisted living provider. And our cost, our price right now, is about $49 per year per bed. All right. And I'm just coming to you and asking you questions as if I were thinking about investing. Who are, who are your chief rivals and what, what, what are the barriers to entry that you have or the things that set you apart from those competitors? Um, yeah, so we do have competition. Right, but it's still, you know, a kind of a, a kind of situation where less than six percent of the market has a solution like us or us. Uh, now, the the exciting thing is that there is more competition, and we're all growing pretty well. Um, in terms of kind of moat, which is protection of our work, I would say that one, uh, we're the only one to to be evidence based in the sense that we're published with some of our work. Uh, the second thing is we're the only solution that covers the workflow and also integrates with the electronic health record. And I think that as often, um, you know, it's kind of when you collect data is what do you do about it? How do you make it actionable? And early next year, we will be theoretically the first one to really apply the work of things like data science to uh, the data that we collect on top of our existing client base and the fact that we have uh, a 97% renewal rate. Great. I know that we're way past our time. Um, I love the answers to my question and I want to thank again uh, Amda and IPAC for putting this together. I'm happy to stay longer. I just want to make a note that initially we said 30 minutes. I can stay much longer if needed and also any other questions we might have. I just have, this is Tom Hayesco. I have one, one quick comment. Yeah. That one, one, I'm a recreational therapist by trade, so it's very oh, cool. nice yeah, to yeah. see this. I, I couldn't you. do it any longer because of the, what you, when you had said it was $10 per member per bed. That was right. <laughs> so yeah. I'm not a recreational therapist anymore. But um, one thing that you may want to explore on this, I know that this is very facility and building specific, but you may want to explore non-pharmaceutical approaches to chronic care management in physician billing. Mm -hmm. That for a post-acute care group, that could be an interesting um, chronic care disease program carrying non-pharmaceutical approaches. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and that's that's a great comment. And RF, uh, this is RF again. And in terms of billing, I think, you know, I really see that, that this could be a good uh, intervention for for uh, secondary payers, right? I mean, like uh, Medicare Advantage programs, mm -hmm. particularly in buildings with high behaviors, right? I mean, they know that the cost of providing care to be patients with behaviors and cognitive impairment is really high, and even with medications, the cost of medications are too high. And then the complication of side effects and the consequences of negative consequence, the cost of those are very high too. So I, I think that this could be a great proposition for secondary Medicare Advantage program who are providing care to highly cognitive impaired patients. 
Yeah, I think on those <laughs> lines, this is Swati. I, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, every, I think, administrator to a DON, to a med me uh, medical director is looking at is your quality measures that are, you know, in the CASPER report or the OSCAR report, whatever you want to call based on MDS uh, um, data. And, um, you know, this kind of goes back to affecting some of those quality measures in a positive way, which, you know, in turn, um, determines, you know, what kind of rating you have as a nursing home. So that is one of the, um, definitely a selling point of this, uh, especially with that decrease, 20% uh, decrease in, in the medication use. Um, I had, a, you know, a question as to the new payment uh, model, the PDPM. Um, does this have a positive effect on, you know, how you can get reimbursed in the new payment model? Yeah, so, so the answer is um, we don't know yet because we don't have data to support it, but in theory, absolutely. And, and the main reason, so obviously PDPM for the, I mean, uh, I'm sure anyone on the line knows about it, but it's really for only for short-term uh, stay residents. But it shifts a lot of the efforts and the energy uh, beyond or outside of the therapy world to nursing and social services. So when you consider the fact that you might have high utilization uh, quitting with patients, like people living with dementia or a high level of depression, you know, we know that non-pharmacological intervention has a huge potential, if used correctly, a huge potential in terms of driving outcomes. So if these outcomes are, uh, you know, managed properly under nursing, uh, restorative nursing, activity, social services, the answer is absolutely yes. Hi, it's Margot again. I have one quick question again. How does the data from the programs that the seniors are involved in, how does that get into the EHR? So <clears throat> that's a good question. Right now, our integration with the EHR is what's called an HR7, and we only get information from the EHR to us. Um, we're actually working now to push back data, um, but what people have been doing is either um, using us as the quote-unquote record of choice for engagement or uh, batch uploading uh, PDF files back to the records of the resident. Uh, this is Brad Markowitz. I have a quick question. How many yes. facilities are using the uh, the program today? And uh, of them, how many of them are paying customers versus pilot sites? With uh, almost 400 buildings in 43 uh, states in Canada, and the bulk is our paying clients. Uh, so when I say the got, bulk. Uh, we probably have we probably have less than five in the long paying. And are uh, uh, do you have um, are these one offs or do you have any arrangements with uh, with chains that are uh, implementing this on a most programmatic of them, basis? Most of them are chains. Most of them are chains. Ah, very good. Um, well, again, thank you everyone for being on the line today tonight. I should say. Thank you very much for that feedback. That was great. Um, and again, thank you for Amda and IPAC uh, for helping me uh, put this together and for the opportunity to present, pitch, and get feedback on this. It's been very, very uh, meaningful to me.